Welcome to Court Set, everyone. A discussion of Donald Trump and the legal issues that surround him or plague him. Day 76 is today, after the election. We have less than 48 hours to go in the Donald Trump presidency. And on this Martin Luther King Day, something very fitting happened. Kamala Harris resigned from the Senate. She's poised to become our first female vice president, our first African-American vice president, our first Indian-American vice president. There are a lot of reports in the news today about Donald Trump going on a pardon spree. It's either going to happen evidently tonight or tomorrow. Um, and so let's do a deep dive on that tonight. Um, so the reports say all sorts of things. Trump's team has assembled paperwork to pardon Lil Wayne. And that's not even the 50th craziest thing to come out of this White House in the last week. Donald Trump is reportedly planning on pardoning a Palm Beach eye doctor who is convicted of multiple counts of medical fraud. At this point, Trump is going to try anything to find someone who's going to actually visit him at Mar-a-Lago. I mean, he really should wait until after his big party on Wednesday to give out those pardons. Otherwise, he might find himself in an empty garden. Well, anyway, the story today began with a New York Times piece last night talking about a market for pardons that Rudy Giuliani has been offering them up, evidently, for the price of $2 million. And look, in a world in which Donald Trump is stiffing him on his legal bills, I guess Rudy figured out another way to pay his legal fees. Um, there are going to be many problems with this. Um, so, yes, the president has a broad pardon power. You know, lots of times the Supreme Court has said that. But that doesn't mean that you can, you know, be bribed for it. And indeed, the Justice Department and two separate opinions by the Office of Legal Counsel have said that despite the president's broad pardon powers, it's subject to the bribery statute. And indeed, you might remember Bill Clinton was investigated uh, for a pardon that he did in the last day of his administration. He was investigated by the Southern District of New York. I mean, you got to wonder, Bill Clinton, you know, kind of such limited imagination, like one retail pardon for sale. I mean, Trump does this wholesale. He's like the Costco of pardons for sale. You know, thinking about doing as many as 100 pardons tomorrow. And this is emblematic of the Trump presidency. I mean, that noble thing that James Madison and others put into the Constitution, they put it in for the grandest of reasons about mercy, about showing leadership and justice. And here you've got Donald Trump who comes along and perverts it in a, way, in a way for him to get some bucks and to stroke his ego. And the thing that's been the most dispiriting about the Trump pardons, and again, we haven't seen this batch, but we've seen the past batches, and they basically go to two categories of people. One category, friends of Trump, people like Michael Flynn, Roger Stone, Paul Manafort. Other category, a bunch of rogues, people like Dinesh D'Souza or Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who represent nothing of America or its values. Donald Trump at this point has issued 70 pardons and 24 commutations. The law professor Jack Goldsmith, a conservative law professor at the Harvard Law School, has analyzed it, and he finds that 84% of those pardons were given to people with a personal or a political connection to the president. Normal presidents look at, when they're deciding about pardons, they look at things like the severity of the offense. Are these folks showing remorse? Um, you know, is it morally justified to pardon the person? Things like that. Donald Trump doesn't care about any of that. He doesn't care what crimes that were committed or who was fleeced. He just wants to take a few more pictures with his giant Sharpie. And in criminal law, We've had this big cleave as we teach criminal law and, and think about it and write about criminal justice over the last many years. There's, you know, so-called white-collar criminals, and then there's the rest. The white-collar criminals are the financial folks and stuff like that. Trump is really emphasizing that in his pardons. He's not emphasizing all the other folks. And, you know, that really sets us backwards because starting in the 1980s, we basically... Uh, moved into a world in which we understood that white-collar defendants were getting a lot of advantages and uh, from the trials to the convictions to the pardons and the like. Trump wants to take us backwards and pardon those folks, not the folks committing other crimes. One of the things we have to worry about the most tomorrow is whether Trump is going to pardon the insurrectionists from last week. Now look, there's no question that would be in total keeping with Trump's style. That is his modus operandi. I do think 
that there are some reasons to, to, to be optimistic about tomorrow, that Trump is not going to pardon the insurrectionists. For one thing, he's got to worry about the impact of such pardons on his impeachment. In this way, you have to think about impeachment not just as being intrinsically right, which it so obviously is, but also it's our last best hope to stop the massive abuse of power that otherwise would have unfurled in this week. It keeps Trump on his toes. Indeed, if he were to pardon the insurrectionists, it'd be part of the impeachment case against him, that he's giving aid and comfort to enemies. He'd be what the law calls an accessory after the fact in many ways. Also, Trump has to fear if he doles out pardons to these folks, they won't have Fifth Amendment protections against self-incrimination. And then they'd have to rat out Trump to the extent that any of them had any contact with him or anything else. So, you know, he always has to worry about that with the pardon power. And finally, the claims for the pardon on these folks is just so laughably thin. I mean, give me a break. These people deserve a pardon? I mean, one of the rioters flew to Capitol Hill on a private jet and now asked Trump for a pardon, essentially saying that she came at his invitation and his bequest. The idea that Trump made me do it, is the, that's like the only defense that makes you look guiltier than the crime itself. And I wonder if people like Rudy Giuliani will be as eager to represent Donald Trump at his impeachment hearing if he gets his hands on a pardon first. There's a whole nother question about pardons, which is, I know many of you have raised in the comments, which is like, how specific do you have to be? Can you just have like a blanket pardon for anything? Well, the text of the Constitution doesn't say one way or the other, but the whole point behind an unlimited pardon power is some sort of popular accountability. That's why our founders put it in. They said, you know, we're going to have almost no restrictions on when you can pardon, but that's because you do it in full view of the public. They got to understand what you're doing. So if you have a blanket pardon that just says, look, I'm absolving you of everything and anything you've ever done, that doesn't, that undermines that accountability function. And indeed, if you go back in English history, people like Blackstone, kind of the leading English commentator at the founding, said that general words of a pardon don't work, that you've got to be specific. Now, it is true that Gerald Ford did pardon Richard Nixon for basically a blanket pardon for all crimes he might have committed in the last five years. And it's also true that Madison, James Madison in 1815, pardoned the followers of the pirate Jean Lafitte, who aided U.S. forces at the Battle of New Orleans. But the 1815 thing is very complicated because that was also part of a war-fighting ability and so on, and might have been justified on other grounds. The Richard Nixon precedent was never tested in court, and the law professor Aaron Rappaport has analyzed 2,200 different pardons between 1974 and 2018, and could only find two blanket, two ones that didn't have specificity. That was Richard Ford's uh, pardon of, excuse me, uh, Gerald Ford's pardon of Richard Nixon and the pardons in the Iran Contra. So there is reason to doubt that you can just have a blanket pardon, but Trump might do it anyway for his family, indeed, possibly himself. And that brings me to the last question, which is can Donald Trump pardon himself? Well, you know, I briefly mentioned this before. The text of the Constitution makes that very difficult because it speaks of granting pardons. And I know Donald Trump likes to talk about himself in the third person, but it just really doesn't make any sense to say, I am granting myself something. I'm not granting myself this ice cream cone that I'm about to eat. I'm taking the ice cream cone. There's a very weird way to think about it textually in our Constitution. More importantly, there is a long-standing legal principle that goes back to 1610 in England in Dr. Bonham's case and then brought to America, which is the whole point of separation of powers, of even the most elemental part of separation of powers, is you can't be a judge in your own case. And that is, of course, what a, par a self-pardon is. There's a 1974 Justice Department opinion that's controlling, that's on the books right now, that says that you can't pardon yourself if you're the president. Now, Bill Barr has been out yesterday and today trying to launder his reputation, such as it is, by saying, well, I left the administration without knowing, I told the president I didn't want to know anything about the pardons. Again, give me a break. The Justice Department has an opinion saying you can't pardon yourself if you're the president. 
Do you, you know, you're, if you're the attorney general, you don't just get to say, I don't want to hear about it or something like that. You've got to stand up and enforce the opinions of the Justice Department. And if Barr won't do it, we certainly will. So if Trump tries to pardon himself, uh, you know, I think that should be tested and challenged absolutely by the new administration. So tonight, on this Martin Luther King Day, and as the Trump administration winds down, I have a dream for Trump's pardons. I have a dream that I wish that as Trump waddles into the Oval Office tomorrow in the midst of signing his hundred or so pardons, I have a dream that he reflects on why he was surrounded by so many people who commit federal crimes. I have a dream for just this once. He looks in the mirror, he looks around the Oval Office, and he realizes the devastation that he has wrought to this country. The devastation to our health, the devastation to our economy, the devastation to our jobs, the devastation to our constitution, the devastation to our values, and most of all, the devastation to our unity. That's Courtside for tonight. I will see you tomorrow.